with Uncle Sam with music and the truth until dawn. Right now, I've got a few words for some of our brothers and sisters in the occupied zone. The chair is against the wall. The chair is against the wall. John has a long mustache. John has a long mustache. It's 12 o'clock, Americans, another day closer to victory. And for all of you out there on or behind the lines, this is your song. <laughs> Hey, and welcome everybody to our Daily Gun Show. We come to you live every weeknight at midnight Eastern for about an hour. We talk about guns. So uh, it's Monday. We'll be talking about behind the scenes a little bit. And I've been working on ammo cans, so we're going to be talking about ammo cans. But uh, I almost was all by myself tonight. Gunsnob joined in from Oklahoma. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. You bet. And we're doing it as an open panel thing lately, so uh, never know who's going to join in. Good to see you on a Monday, and I don't know anything going on over the weekend. Um, just shot some, got a bunch of kids out and shot some, but that was about it. Shot some kids. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> well, let me rephrase that. The kids that shot some targets. Right on. What's it like over there? Is it as horribly hot out as it is here? Well, it was Saturday. It was miserable. Then Sunday, it rained nonstop all day. And today, it was like 80 for a high, no humidity, absolutely beautiful. Best day we've had since April. Yeah, we've got a break every once in a while when it rains. Whatever gets cloudy. Not tonight, though. So I kind of do this... Um, winging it at half the damn time and if there's more people in here this is when i sneak out and let the dog out and open windows and stuff but it's just you so i don't want to leave you hanging here um but it's getting hot so if anybody else wants to jump in then you can talk and i could go open up some door windows so um tonight we're talking about where my notes at i guess i just look at the show we're talking about uh gimp photo paint inkscape and photoshop uh, Clover never joins in anymore on the late show like this. It must be too late for him. And Night Strike couldn't jump in tonight. Have you used uh, any of these programs? Do you draw on the computer at all? No, I don't draw. Clover's live on his Patreon chat. I just jumped over from there. I yeah. abandoned him so you wouldn't be alone. Yeah, right on. I don't care. Uh, I mean, I appreciate it, but I don't mind. <laughs> I'm uh, leave something that's decent. I just want to keep a consistent conversation going. Uh, it doesn't have to be, it's obviously not, trying to impress everybody every night. Uh, but basically, GIMP is a free program. It's a software that doesn't come with your computer, so you have to go sort of get it. It's open source, so it's available for free. You download it, and as it gets upgraded, as people figure out ways to do things better, uh, as a community collaborative effort, people uh, update it, and you just keep updating it like you would any paid software, only it's coming from like the greater you know, cumulative effort. Um, and it has its advantages and its disadvantages, but it's pretty decent, strong software. Uh, Inkscape is similar, but it'll, instead of being like a Photoshop, I would call GIMP more of a Photoshop. Inkscape is more of an Adobe um, Illustrator, which we've talked about before. It's made, made for uh, Photoshop you'd use for editing a photograph or uh, worrying about like the darkness or contrast or light balance or shades of color or you know, vividness of the color, where uh, Illustrator is if you're going to make like a sign or a t-shirt or a button or a patch, something that's a little bit more like a logo. So is the, it, go ahead. Oh, I was just, is, it Illustrator, is Adobe Illustrator the one you use to draw all those cartoons and stuff? Yeah, or the free version would be Inkscape. And for a minute there, I was getting the Adobe software for a few years from one of the people over on Gun Channels. And uh, that was a great contribution to the effort because it's it's powerful software and it costs something every month uh, so we were getting a free version of it basically for years when that ended um, I looked for options and that's when I found Inkscape and a couple other some free softwares and that Inkscape really impressed me and if I wasn't kind of I'm just I need to use Adobe I it's just I'm so familiar with it and it is so powerful and for the video editing I need it and the way that their packages work you it's really not cost effective to buy one item from them you might it's just as easy or just the same cost almost to buy all their packages uh so anyway uh inkscape is pretty powerful so i'd highly recommend it if you're looking for a, a free version of an um, adobe illustrator well, yeah. i use 
I use Adobe Premiere on my video, but I pay mm-hmm. for it every month. Right. And that's because that's how Adobe structures their payments now. But those are video editors. These, these things that we're talking about tonight, I guess I didn't preface it, is all just still image editing. So GIMP is for just editing and photograph. Paint is why well, I was going through GIMP. Inkscape are both open source, so they're both very powerful and free. Uh, Paint is also free, less powerful. It's part of Windows and included there. There's probably something on Macintosh, but I don't know what it is. So those people can go figure it out themselves. But um, they're free, so that's nice. And they're on your computer, so they're not taking up any extra room. And honestly, if you're using any of these other ones, you've also got Paint. So, uh, And there's actually two versions of Paint, I think, in the new versions of Windows. One of them I haven't used, but the old Paint still seems to work the same. And it's pretty powerful for being just a little free you know, piece of software on your computer. Um, so if you haven't used that, I'd recommend it. I'm not going to get too much in more into it tonight other than to mention that those are some options that are available for editing pictures. Um, and it's useful. They have that skill. Editing a picture, you know, we see obvious things like memes and stuff. Uh, but just today, I had a, uh, a gun that I was transferring, you know, doing an FFL, and I was sending the guy the tracking number. And because I went to the, you know, I had to go to the place to get the piece of paper. It wasn't electronic. So I needed to take a, it just was easier to take a picture of the receipt. So I took a picture of the receipt, but the receipt had credit card numbers on it. Uh, so just having the, you know, knowledge that a software program will allow me to do it. And then, you know, experience using the software to go in there and crop or trim down the edges of the picture so that I sent them the necessary stuff without the extraneous stuff, uh, then, you know, it's a useful skill to have. So. You can do it with your phones easily. You can do it with your uh, operating systems. And I guess we're explaining you can do it with some more uh, fancy software at either free or paid levels. And um, I'm not going to get too much into the how-to because there's literally, I, every time I need to know something, I just go to YouTube. Um, have you guys, uh, Steve jumped into, have you guys used um, any kind of software that you have to go online and find tutorials or how to use it? I use Canva and PicMonkey both, and I went on YouTube to learn how to use them. And my Adobe, for that matter. I learned how to use it off YouTube. Most definitely. Everything I do, I pretty much learn off of YouTube. Yeah, so that's where, you know, I'm thinking most of us have done that. If we, I mean, like, on time I fixed my refrigerator doing that, and I had a pretty good, big, good idea of what was going on. I typed in my model number, and boom, I knew exactly what was going on. The car all the time, right? I'm sure people do it for all kinds of things, and uh, you can do it for uh, stuff like this, too. So, like I say, it's, it's a skill that I think is worth having, being able to manipulate photographs. And if you want to write something on there, I guess, um, or just make a ugly, shadowy picture brighter and a little more appealing, uh, knowing that it's just a couple of wiggles with your thumb, really, uh, to do that is uh, you know, the difference between... You know, having to sit there for half an hour taking photographs and then knowing, oh, I got a good enough photograph. I can make this work, you know, get on with your life or whatever. So uh, anyway, I guess we just want to encourage people on Mondays to remember that the Internet's a tool. It's made for 16-year-old girls. Uh, that uh, The other side is paying people who go to school, go to college to learn how to use it. And they're watching trends and learning how to be sophisticated and put fancy stuff up there. But the nuts and bolts are available for everybody. And as an army of people who know how to use the tools is more effective and more useful than any number of marketing firms that Bloomberg can pay for. So uh, that's why we want to encourage people who are two-way advocates to uh, consider activism, you know, electronic activism as well. And uh, hopefully we'll keep encouraging people to use some tools and use their computers and their phones as weapons. That's what the fuck. Let's militarize the Internet as far as uh, two-way activism. All right, so with that, we can move on along. We usually feature a member over on Gun Channels, and today I think he's out there listening. He's got a big green dot, and uh, today we're featuring Dead Horse. Have you ever heard of Dead Horse before? He used to come on this show. Got a link. Never. I think he's uh, too busy with his reloading right now to hop on the show. Yeah, because he's whenever he's not actually doing a video about setting up the thing, he's, like, sleeping because he's constantly wearing his arm on. You would think they'd come up with like a foot pedal, you know, where you'd like just have to kind of pump the foot pedal. I don't know, maybe like a bicycle or something where you could like sit in a chair and have one of them reclining bicycle type of pedals. Have that pump your. It just seems like 
Go ahead. I was just say, gonna say, just crank out some rounds while I riding the exercise bike, or yeah, exactly. <laughs> It seems like all he's done lately is help David learn set up his reloading bench. So, well, yeah, that's pretty much what it is. So he's doing that, and he's getting his own thing set up. So yeah, he's obviously one of the people we built gun shells for. Somebody is interested in uh, creating projects and sharing them with people and uh, helping people out and inspiring people and you know, does all kinds of stuff for gun channels. So thanks, Dead Horse. Of course, his light went dark, so he's probably not even listening. Maybe his ears are ringing. <laughs> No, he's a pretty good guy. A real nice guy. Yeah, we'll keep him around. Let's see. I'm trying to open up my notes here because I didn't write everything, I guess, in here. What is today? The 20th? Yeah. All right. So we got a gun shop. Every day we do this show uh, on the daily so that we can feature a gun shop. And today it's going to be called uh, Hub. The Hub in... Lakeside, Arizona. So it's uh, Arizona's big square, big rectangle. Phoenix kind of in the middle, two suns, about halfway between Phoenix and the Mexican border. And this place would be sort of going east and a little bit north from Phoenix. And that's where uh, a couple of reservations meet up. And then it's all mountainous and uh, green. So not like you normally think of Arizona, more like you think of Colorado or something. Uh, it's a big hunting area and skiing because it's all snowy in the winter. So all the people from Phoenix go up there and hang out, and a lot of people hunt out there because there's elk and turkey and bear and all kinds of neat stuff. Elk, uh, antelope a little bit south of there. So this is a gun shop right in the middle of it all, and it's kind of a big one. I didn't know about it until I was testing out the new van. Um, drove it up to the Red Dawn shoot filming locations, and on the way back I went past uh, the, the very large array from the movie Contact, you know, those giant radio telescopes out in the desert. And when you come west from there, you, this this is pretty much that part of Arizona. So I found it on that trip and was surprised. You can see from this picture, it's a really big metal building, so no supports or anything in the middle. Just a huge building. They've got it's a pawn shop, so they've got um, a lot of stuff that they've kind of acquired, I guess, over the years. You can kind of see in these pictures where it's almost like a museum on the wall. And because it's so new, it's not all dusty and dirty or nothing. And because they kind of intentionally set it up to be a uh, informational you know it's it's really neat they've got a lot of stuff included there and there's as you can see it's all labeled and stuff so you can just spend time hanging out in there and getting some uh seeing some of the different uh you know evolution of firearms and stuff it's really cool this this side you can see is a bunch of mounts and stuff behind me it's the same way uh where i'm standing in this picture if i've gone behind me and a little bit back is their range they have a really big uh, indoor range and uh there's a lot of tools and stuff too so it's a pretty big pawn shop as well uh, we've done a review of it before, but it's worth doing it again. Uh, I follow them on Instagram. They're pretty active over there, which is kind of neat. A lot of times uh, shops, you know, more of that kind of stuff. And uh, definitely worth checking out if you're ever in uh, Arizona and you find yourself in that area. It's, uh, like I say, worth, worth checking it out. And for sure you find something if you're looking for something, too. They seem to have, you know, I don't even have good pictures of their gun stuff, but very complete gun shop and uh, accessories and things like full lines of, different manufacturers and stuff. Serious gun shop. Looks pretty nice. Yeah, I pick these ones that are kind of middle of nowhere sometimes, so I doubt anybody's been to it, but um, uh, never know. Yeah, we've got two different shows going. Uh, Ellis is going right now, and it sounds like Clover's going, so there's some audience to them. But we've got 11 of the um, dedicated viewers, so appreciate that. Uh, let's see, anything else in the notes? Not too much. We have this. Oh, that's from last week. So what did it say, 20th? No, nope, don't have anything there. So I guess uh, we'll just jump into this big history thing, see if there's anything in here. I'd like to talk about history once in a while. Drop that link for you guys if you want to check it out. And let's see, 20th again, so here. Anybody going to gun shows this weekend? No. One here in Tucson, so I'm halfway thinking about it. I always lose money at it, though. I've never even hardly paid my table at this show. I hate to give up on it. 
So I'm just looking down at some of the stuff here. 1910, the first shot fired from an airplane was during a test fight over Brooklyn. 1920, American radio station, pioneering American radio station in Detroit began broadcasting daily. So that's kind of neat. It was a daily gun show. 1920, they started broadcasting on the radio daily. Today is also the day that radar was used for the first time. Damn. And in 1941, Hitler authorized the development of the V-2. All kinds of neat stuff today. 1942, plutonium was first weighed by the guy who discovered it, co-discovered it. In 1942, searchlights crossing the sky, which used to be a feature or a fixture of Hollywood premieres, ended, ceased this day in 1942 in an attempt to avoid any surveillance by enemy forces during World War II on the West Coast. They asked them to keep the coast dim. So they stopped. You remember those giant searchlights they used to have? Now that I'm thinking about it, you used to see those things like in uh, old movies and stuff. I just assume because it was giant, like fire going on right in the sidewalk. This seems pretty hot. In 1866, yeah, 1866. Andrew, Andrew Johnson. Johnson. Whoa, why am I echoing? There we go. In 1866, President Andrew Johnson formally declares the Civil War over. Today. Interesting. I didn't know that. Like Czechoslovakia got the crap kicked out of them by the socialists today when they were trying to get uh, get rid of Czech, uh, socialism. Huh. In 1986, in Edmond, Oklahoma, U.S. postal employee Pat I can't even say his name guns down 14 of his coworkers and then commits suicide, coining the term. Wait, what happened? A U.S. postal worker in Edmond, Oklahoma, shoots 14 of his co-workers and then commits suicide. Uh, Voyager left today in 1977. Voyager 2, I should say, an unmanned spacecraft carrying a 12-inch copper record containing readings from dozens of languages. So that just left in 77. It's already out of the solar system, I think. In 1975, Viking 1 is launched by NASA using the Titan vehicle. A uh, launch vehicle. Oh, I missed that one. Yeah, that's cool. Hello, Gary. Hey, oh. it's over. What's that? Dell is over. Yeah. And then let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Medal of Honor today. So we just got done with history here. Oh, wait, what's this about hydrogen bomb? 1953, Soviet Union publicly acknowledged that it tested a hydrogen bomb. Sons of bitches. All right, I think that's all I need out of there. And then we looked at that gun shop already. And now we can screen share because now I'm going to talk about what I've been working on today, which is ammo cans. So has anybody ever paid any attention to ammo cans before? <clears throat> well, I own one. Which one do you own? Do you know? It's a green one. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually a military surplus can. I know that much. I'd have to go get it. It's not exactly lightweight. Because but... it's got a bunch of stuff in it, you mean? Yeah, it's got a bunch of ammo in it. <laughs> so I've got a uh, site I've been putting back together, and I don't know if the video went up or not, but I was uh, putting the site back together. It's screen sharing, right? Yeah. So um, this is a site that I had a while back when I wanted to get my ammo collection online, mainly to put it up in a way that would allow me to put the ammo next to each other with consistent um, scale, right? So you can see the difference between. It gets interesting when you look at like rimfire, right? Where there's a lot of different size of ammo and stuff. 
So anyway, I put this back together over the weekend, and one of the things that I've been wanting to do uh, is ammo cans. And I hadn't, this stuff is already, I had built this years ago, and I was putting it back together. There's a lot of work to do on it still, but for the most part, that part's done. I started getting into the ammo cans, though, and it was empty. And since I just got done building something, I figured I'd keep building. So um, I did kind of the same thing. I haven't sorted them well yet. But, um, you know, I know there's ammo cans, and I know that, you know, the military doesn't just go, oh, yeah, ammo cans. Like, there's got to be some history to them, and, there's, you know, it's all recorded. So as I started digging into it, there's basically, um, you know, the timeline, they start with cartridges from black powder or whatever, right? And then they go from paper cartridges to metal cartridges, and then they start putting those cartridges into something, and they start out with boxes, and then they go from boxes to wood, and then from wood to metal. And that's basically World War One is where you get ammo cans, and those are spam cans, like what the Soviets still use, right? And then you get ammo boxes, which is when they figured out putting all that time and effort into a spam can is stupid, because once you open it, the ammo gets all wet, and you know, depending on how good the ammo is, that hurts it. And uh, you can't reclose it or use it for anything. So you just spent all that time and effort making the thing and dragging it over to the war. And then uh, you can't, you just got to throw it away. And potentially the enemy's going to use it for something. All right. Okay, there's one I got right there. Right on. So it says uh, fuse or something, proximity fuse. But uh, it doesn't give us anything about... Uh, of can, but at least we can kind of see the can now. We'll be able to figure out what it is, I think. So we basically get from, like I say, the ammo cans, which we did use in World War II a little bit, uh, these things, um, which kind of look like a spam can, or a can of, yeah, they look a lot like a can of spam, really. And you would have a key on it, and you would open it, and it would destroy the can as you open it, you know, and put a rip in the side of the can. So there was no way to put that back together. Uh, they figured out real quick in World War II that that was a pain. So we started out with ammo cans for machine guns, for belt-fed machine guns, and that is the M1. So that's this guy. I guess it's right here. So the M1 is the narrow one, right? So the the narrow one is, uh, we got narrow ones, we got fat ones, and then we got tall ones, generally. The narrow one started out being 30, 30 odd six for the uh, 1919 type of machine gun. And the ammo can sits on the side. We've seen it sit on the side of machine guns before, I guess. Drop it in here. I think I do. Um, when it's stuck on the side of a machine gun like this, right? So the ammo can was sort of part of the tripod, but also, you know, not because you'd take it off and throw it away, but you could also just throw ammo back into it. So it's sort of a weird role between being part of the gun and everything and then not, you know, because obviously once it's empty and you've got a replaceable lid, you can put anything in there and they can start using it for stuff. So they started figuring that out and they became less and less of um, uh, a box for one type of ammo as much as they would make a couple of different size boxes and use them for different types of things. So anyway, we start with the thin ones and then you get the 50 BMG is the uh, M2, which is the fat one, and then they go through M1 to M1A1, and then you go from M2 to M2A1. So that's where they, you know, they built the first one. They figured out ways to improve it. Uh, then you just get into bigger sizes. The deeper ones are for bigger ordnance, um, rockets and um, mortars and grenades and stuff. Uh, but otherwise, it's been, been pretty neat. I spent most of the day going through and researching what the actual names of these things are. It's, interestingly, there's not much info out there on the specific ones. A lot of times, like if you're at a store or something, it'll say 20 millimeter uh, ammo can, but they don't put in there what if, you know, is it an, a PA-154 or is it this other one, you know? So uh, going through and figuring them out and then uh, um, basically laying them out like this so you can see them kind of next to each other. And then, you know, now it's got some framework here. I can go in and start working on things like figuring out what the stencils are, uh, figuring out, uh, for example, what the kind of the more common one, the M2, probably the most common one would be the M2A2. So, or excuse me, M2A1, right? So the 50 BMG box, but they use that thing for all kinds of stuff. So you can put 100 rounds of 50 BMG in links, but you can also put 1,000 rounds of 9 millimeter in there. They can put 1,000 rounds of 45 in there. They can put 400 rounds of uh, 5.56 five, as long as it's on, oh, they put it on two big drums for the saw, and then 
Um, pretty sure that's 308, but 400 rounds of 308 in there. So I'm going to start adding stuff like that to some of these. Then you get into the neat stuff of, have you ever seen some of the forum posts where people are just, you know, talking about how much uh, commercially packaged ammo they can fit in some of these boxes? I don't know if anybody's researched that, but that used to be a pertinent thread on most of the forums because people would get an ammo can. And most of the time we call them 50s or fat 50s or 30s, right? 30s are the thin ones, 50s are the fat ones, and then we call fat 50s. They're not 50s, they're for saws, but whatever. We've got those three main sizes typically. And uh, on the forums a lot, you know how 762 by 39, when you open up a spam can, it'll be in packets of 20 usually, or if you buy boxes, it'll be in boxes of 20. Um, you know, people will figure out ways to stack them in these boxes and then they'll put those keys or those like blueprints online so that people know how to most efficiently stack their ammo for prep or whatever in these boxes. So I figured I'd add some of that stuff too. I did not know that existed that you could look up a diagram on how to stack your ammo because I always just cram everything in there till it, you know, and then stand on it to close the door. You know, that might have been an era thing because I'm thinking the last time I really put any effort into it was pre Y2K. And there was a lot of people buying ammo in all different kinds of ways and putting it into, into ammo cans because, you know, we can get, or I should say ammo boxes because we can get ammo boxes so cheaply, you know. So, I mean, that's what I keep most all my ammo in is just ammo cans. It's a lot of them are just the cheap plastic ones you buy at a gun store or whatever. But Well, and that's something else that I'm not too interested in, but I'm sure lots of people have. So one of the things I'll, I'll include here later on, because it's not you know necessary for when I was just trying to figure out the history of it here. Uh, but I'll add in here because, yeah, there's the well, there's new manufacturer that are basically on the same spec because, again, military says, M582 or 592 ammo can, you know, there's a part number for that, this NSN number, you know, that tells somewhere there's a, you know, there's some kind of build to for that NSN, right? It'll say it's a metal box with such and such specification with such and such, blah, 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 certain thickness and certain blah, 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 all down to the color and the, you know, everything. So somebody can just go get that military data sheet and just make one, right? Make another one. And yeah, that's what you see a lot at, um, the big box online stores is the brand new ones, which are not even ever been military made. They're just commercial made. I don't know what they cost, but I figure, I don't know. I mean, they figure about the same cost, right? They're not like more, really less. But the thing is, they don't have a bunch of dents in them and they're not, you know, painted with a bunch of weird shit potentially or painted three times. Sometimes you buy used stuff and it's painted three times. The ones I like. Most of them are just uh, like some Plano or something brand, you know, like a tackle box brand, just little plastic rubber seal ones. And, you know, just, they're like three bucks a piece or something when you find them on sale. More like similar in shape and not trying to mimic or emulate an ammo can. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're called ammo cans, but they're not trying to, you know, emulate a military no. one. They're just, just for that. I would say most of my ammo cans are military ammo cans. I've had a couple, like three or four of the 50 cal fat ones. Uh, I think they say ProTac on them or something, but I think they still have military stamping on them. I don't know if they're just like resold through ProTac, if that's the name I remember. That's like a sticker that's on it. But yeah, I'd say most of mine are military ammo cans. I mean, I live next to a training base, so they're out there shooting um, A-10s are all around and whatever else they have, F-16s, I guess, and whatever other stuff comes around. I'm on the helicopter shooter. And then we got Border Patrol that actually shoots out of there. So we've got um, pallets, you know, when, when the government gets done with an ammo can, I imagine they can reuse some of them, but there's no way they're using all of them. They just go through too many ammo or go through too much ammo. So anyway, you can buy the stuff by the pallets. So I'm guessing, you know, those surplus stores aren't, they're familiar with that. They're buying them by the half pallet or dozens and dozens at a time. Um, so anyway, we see a lot of them uh, around here that are like 50s. Probably different if you're near like a rifle training area where they're going to have a lot of the rifle hands left over. But half the time when I was doing the research and looking around, um, there's a bunch of them where people get that you can buy offline 
cans that were built because you can the numbers are on the cans the, the production dates and all that uh there's cans that are in stores for sale for like 15 bucks that are a year old like because again they were built they don't know what the ammo is going to do so they built it to go to war but instead it goes to like some basic training unit and they you know shoot it and they throw it away so um you know you buy an ammo can that's basically a year old and all that gasket and everything, all the hinges and stuff have been opened once. So that's a massive deal. Considering it probably costs a lot more than 15 bucks to make a real one or to make them, you know, government. Yeah, I'd say going price and, you know, where I'm at is probably eight to $12, depending on where you're at or, you know, if you're at a swap meet or at a flea market, eight to 12 bucks is probably about going right around here. These tall ones are pretty neat. I've got one in the van that's probably one of these. That's kind of a, not super huge, but and not the tallest one or anything. So that it's some of these are so tall they'd fall over, you know, with anything in them. Uh, but I use one as sort of a stool. You know, it's about the right height to use as a stool in the van. I, mean, I think I have one of these really tall ones somewhere. And it's kind of little, actually. I've just got a bunch of these because a local store to us had them on sale, like for Black Friday for like two fifty. So I bought like ten of them. These little yeah, cheap. Yeah, I'd like to see some of those things can be substantial, and the plastic is thick, right? And I don't know what it does for as far as UV. I mean, anything in the sun is going to fail compared to metal. But just in general, I'm interested to see how those things are going to last over the years. Because our metal stuff, obviously, unless it rusts, it's going to last pretty much forever. And then. You know, the plastic has no reason to fall apart, but I, at least out here, um, unless it's a plastic that's treated for UV, it'll just kind of dry out. And, you know, I've gone to pick up like totes or whatever, like plastic containers, and the handles just come off. It's all just brittle. It all, you know, it's just turned into nothing. It turned into like it lost all its strength or whatever. Oh, yeah. But I also, mine just sat on a bookcase in my office. So it didn't really matter to me too much. They're not out in the sun, really. All right, so that's a little bit of what I was working on today, and it's like uh, you got a tall fifty, is what it's saying, Gary. There's a fat fifty, which is basically an inch taller than the fifties, and I guess that was made for two saw can or two saw drums or whatever you call it thing that comes off the bottom of the saw. Zach. I guess Gary went to sleep on us again. Yeah, he went over to Alice's where he doesn't realize he's muted. Pants has seen he has one of those plastic ones. These plastic ones are neat. That's one of the reasons I wanted to do this, too, because I've always had one, too, and I didn't know what it was for. It says it's for the Bradley fighting vehicle, which might explain why they are they were kind of a blip on the radar and they're not around anymore. They were neat. They are made out of plastic, and both sides open, like this side opens and that side opens, but there's, like, dumb shit in the middle, like for holding rockets or whatever it held, 25-millimeter cartridges. So there's like this built-in plastic infrastructure crap that you can't take out. Makes it kind of not as useful as it could be. But it's super no, small. It's like no, a, I didn't fall asleep. I just stepped away for a second. Sorry about that. I know where he's I was just saying you typed over there that you got a uh, the 50 tall. Uh -huh. like, it was like a fat 50, they call it. And that's for two saw drums or the sacks, the corner of the saw. Uh-huh. That might be what it is. But there's also one, I guess, that's similar in size and shape that was for night vision and stuff. So they would add foam in that one, I guess. Anyway, they're kind of neat looking them up. And now we got them all in one place. So if anybody needs to see which ones are which or whatever, I'll be uh, adding more information as I find it. That's one of the neat thing about the regular 50 cal ammo cans. You can go online and buy like the foam inserts to hold whatever you particularly want to put in them. Guns, camera, whatever. Exactly. And that's the thing. They've been around for so long. And even though they've changed, it's all been changes with the because the guns change. They change how they affix to a machine gun or a tripod. And then they, um, you know, they change things about the outside, how the lid works and stuff. So the inside diameter has been the same forever. And I've seen... One of the first things I bought online from a, not online, off of a catalog when I was a kid was the little trays that you'd put in, like stack them, I think four trays into a ammo can. And you could just pull the trays out, sort of. It was like a 
most complicated tackle box or like most complicated toolbox ever. But um, you know, for storing things uh, away that you can get back to, you know, get back, kind of keep sorted, pretty handy. But yeah, I've seen the foam ones like you're talking to. I've also seen like um, the nylon. Ever seen like with a five gallon bucket where it'll make like a little nylon skirt thing that fits in there and it holds tools and stuff. I've seen things like that that you put a can, put around a can and it's sort of like a nylon thing and it gives it like side saddles and stuff. So if you're taking a can, I guess to the range or something, it kind of makes it, I don't know, more useful. Put some pockets on the outside of it. I guess thinking about that, there's also things that you can strap like five or six cans into or onto so they don't go tumbling all around the back of a truck or something. Yeah, I mean, I just pulled it up on Amazon. There's like a 24 pistol magazine holder insert for 50 cal can. There's a two pistol holder for 50 cal can. Just all sorts of stuff. And some of these cans are the same diameter as the 50. They're just way taller. So I imagine those kind of things, if you are prepping or cashing, you can stack those things and have a bunch of stuff all organized in there safe. Hmm. I mean, that makes a pretty cheap pistol case, too. I don't guess they're necessarily lockable, but you could probably oh. fashion a way to lock them. Yeah, it's pretty pretty quick to modify them to lock. There's some devices out there that are like, you know, nice hardware to lock them, but I always was able to make do with an eye bolt and a couple of nuts and washers and a lock for the most part. But you can definitely make it fancier than that. They're metal, so they're just regular steel, so it's possible to weld on them and stuff. Then there's always uh, like radios. People have made uh, battery packs out of them, uh, solar power battery you know, holders and things like that. So uh, I don't know, I've seen some radios and waterproof speakers kind of things been made out of them. Yeah, I've seen some of the speakers, and those are really cool. I've wanted, I see them all over like Instagram, but I've wanted to hear one in person. But I mean, the price has been pretty high on them, so I couldn't justify the money. But if you're going to do it yourself, it seems like something that'd be really cool. Yeah, my friend likes to fart around. He took um, like the Raspberry Pi, a little tiny computer size of a pack of cigarettes, put it in one with uh, like a keyboard that projects. So that you don't have the keyboard necessarily, but a little thing that projects a keyboard, and then um, put like a little entertainment thing in there. So he basically just takes this thing camping with him, and then it it's got a projector on, so it projects on the side of the kit and tent or whatever. Then uh, the keyboard is a projector, a little thingy. So it's kind of a neat little gizmo he made out of one of the tall cans. There's a lot of uses for ammo cans, though. Like, I even keep one, a lot of times I'll either take one on the boat or on a jet ski with us just to keep our stuff in to keep it dry because they're, you know, cheaper than a big dry box by far. Mm, heavier, though. I guess they probably would float, though, as long as you don't have, like, just ammo in it. Well, I mean, I keep it in the compartments latched up or something, but I usually use those cheap plastic ones just because they're so cheap and I have so many of them anyway, so they're not very heavy. No, that's true. And as long as it's got a waterproof uh, O-ring on there, then it's buoyant. Yeah. I bought a couple of those uh, 30 cal cans thinking I was going to fill it full of shotgun shells. So that way I went out trap shooting. I could just carry all the ammo in one box. Well, shotgun ammo is pretty heavy. So I ended up using it to store my 3D printer filament in. And <laughs> that's not bad at all. Yeah, that's the thing. Once you fill up a giant can, it can get pretty heavy. Well, I mean, if you got your 3D printer filament in it, then you technically could have a gun in it. I could have several. I mean, don't tell anybody. Yeah, true. Of course, they might blow up in your hand, but, you know. I mean, that whole thing is crazy. I mean, I, mean, I understand technology is going to move forward. But to 3D print a gun is that I would want to shoot, that's pretty crazy. But I have 3D printed 80% lower jigs, which is pretty awesome. Oh, that's interesting. I never thought about doing that. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, that's kind of why I bought a 3D printer. I was like, I could spend 
a hundred bucks on a jig or I could spend 250 on a 3d printer and, you know, kill two birds with one stone. And yeah, that's, that's what I did. I ended up buying a 3d printer and it took me a while to get it dialed in, but the jigs, it works. That's very cool. And then you got a printer that can obviously do way more stuff than the jig is ever going to just you know, do. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, my old lady is all in the little trinkets and crafty stuff. So, I mean, now it's pretty much just used to print off flowers and unicorns. So just like what night strikes would be. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So it's one day. So let's take a look at some of the events that are coming up on the calendar. We've got a calendar over on gun channels. So when you log into the main page here, scroll down a little bit on the left, we've got some of the recent more uh, current ones more um, ones that are going to happen soonest. Uh, we got the uh, Connecticut Citizens Defense League annual picnic and their poker run coming up in September. I uh, just found out about this NRA carry guard, which is uh, sort of a mini version of the NRA show. This is in Virginia and uh, it's NRA carry guard. So I think there's about a hundred and something seminars this weekend also. So if anybody's in that in the area, uh, cost 30 bucks, I think to go. And it sounds like a mini version of the uh, NRA annual events as far as the booths and things, and then, like, say, a bunch of seminars. So, never heard about it, but it's the second year that they've done it now. Well, we've got the bullpup shoot coming in uh, in Illinois the weekend before the gun rights policy conference. For anybody that's got time on their hands and planning on going to the gun rights policy conference, if you head over towards Iowa, uh, this place called The Site is going to host the bullpup shoot again. Kind of a neat thing. It's more than just bull pups, but it's predominantly bull pups, put on by Manicore Arms. Uh, got the gun rights policy conference coming up at the end of September on the 21st. All the gun owners' rights groups get together every year. They've been doing it for 30 years. This year it'll be in Chicago. Highly recommend you check that out. Then you've got the uh, tri state full auto shoot. Uh, Snob, you put this one in here, huh? Yeah, I put that one on there. So this one's also in Oklahoma, but way the hell over in the stupid panhandle. So kind of weird place to have one, but neat. That's the same weekend as the uh, gun rights policy conference. I also like that it's in Oklahoma just a couple of weekends before the Knob Creek one. So that's kind of cool. I like that they're doing something like that. We've got this thing here. I've never been to it, but it's the uh, Southeast Outdoor Press Association. So it's a credential you can get as an outdoor writer. And this is their conference. You can tell by the states there. It's uh, Texas, Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Georgia, Florida, all the way up to Kentucky, Tennessee, and Carolinas, Virginia. I can't tell if it goes north. It looks like it does go north of Virginia, even so maybe even West Virginia. And uh, I keep putting it. I put it on here because I'm interested to see if anybody does. Uh, join up or if anybody from it comes around and tells us about it but uh, it's a press credential so if you're creating content always a good idea to get some press credentials uh, the knob creek is a machine gun shoot that goes on in kentucky that's coming up on october 12th and then this last one is the national association of sporting goods wholesalers it's a traveling show it's kind of a mini version of shot show uh, without so much um, behind the scenes stuff shot show has a lot of things like zippers and metal manufacturers and you know people that supply the stuff to the industry uh, national outdoor sporting goods is the uh, the stores and the manufacturers so none of the in-between stuff so it's a little bit different show if you ever watch gun blast they go to that every year uh, i don't know where it is it's probably in missouri or something it usually travels around a little bit so that's some of the stuff that's going on on the calendar. There's more. If you go to the events page on Gun Channels, it'll take you into all the stuff that's listed. It goes way into next year. If you ever want to post something, we encourage you to do so. Any member of Gun Channels who's logged in can go to the events tab, click on create a new event, just follow the steps there. And it's all about letting people know what's coming up, but also helping out some of these organizations like Cycle Campus Post and stuff for the Connecticut Citizens Defense League. It helps that organization out to be on a page like Gun Channels that has a lot of members you know, being active over here. It's, it's a way to help uh, behind the scenes connect some of these little sites out there that might be struggling, uh, connecting them to a big site with a lot of activity. And that gives them a little bit more clout on the internet. So we build these tools for us, but we also build them to help the Second Amendment. So I mentioned earlier, it's always we want to encourage people to consider the internet a tool. 
And this is yet another way that we can use that tool and uh, hone our skills out there. Uh, knowing how the internet works is easy. There's nothing to it. So it's been the same for all time. Just the skins on the outside change and the way people use it changes. And uh, there's definitely no reason why we have to do what other people tell us to do on the internet. All right. Patrick is saying they'd like to go to the one in Chicago. I hope you do. Uh, the gun owners rights organizations are run by regular people. Alan Gottlieb, for example, started the uh, gun owner or the uh, citizens committee to uh, keep and bear arms, which is what became the Second Amendment Foundation. He started that when he was 26 years old and he's still kicking and the uh, organization still running. He was just a regular person. He's been doing the uh, organizing this gun, uh, the gun the gun rights policy conference for 30 something years now. Um, you could donate money to his organization. I'm sure he's happy with that. But sitting down in the seats at that in that room with with them each year is I can only assume more uh, useful than any amount of money that anybody could send. It, let, it keeps them going as human beings. And uh, uh, whenever CNN or whoever shows up, they like to show up on Sunday. My experience with the Gun Rights Policy Conference is Saturday it'll be full sometimes, usually kind of full. Sunday, it's like everybody said, oh, I put in my work for the Second Amendment, and they leave. I don't know what goes on, but people leave, and uh, the audience dwindles to just tiny, tiny amount of people, and that's when CNN will show up, and that'll be their, you know, their example of what the gun rights lobby is like. So, yeah, being there in the seats uh, is definitely a, a major form of activism. I've heard several interviews from Alan Gottlieb. He's a really smart guy and really good at what he does. Over on the Gun Channel side yesterday saying he's been in Knob Creek. It's very worth the trip. Swap meet and gun shop are huge. I've heard that, that the swap. I know that the swap meet gun shop thing that's there is awesome for collectible stuff, at least Kalashnikov stuff. I know people that found some really neat stuff there. And, uh, yeah, it's definitely something that uh, you know, is designed for spectators and stuff. It's like Pants just posted a picture. That's cool. We'll flip over to that. So... Definitely uh, for mortars or something that I can't tell from looking. But what I'll try to do is on the um, on the thing that I'm making, the key over there, is I'll make it searchable by the some of the, the uh, stenciling that's on them. Because as I'm digging in, some of these cans are used for multiple things. But for the most part, there's only five or six things. So if we list the five or six things that they're used for, so we can just search for what's stenciled on their can and figure out right away what can they've got. And maybe that'll help you with inserts, but we can hook up the, you know, the descriptions with videos people have done with projects and stuff. Maybe that'll give people some idea what to do. Because I've got cans just the same way, just kind of laying around. Because one day I'm going to do something cool with them. <laughs> I think those are like the, what I was calling the 30 cal cans that I thought I was going to fill with shotgun shells for some crazy reason. Oh, you're talking a substantial can because a 30 cal can, yeah, is like the smallest of all ammo cans. You're talking a fairly large one, then. Oh, no, it's freaking huge. I mean, yeah. Um, uh, you I your 30 cal because that, you know, when it's a belt fed gun, they can sometimes will, especially like on an airplane or something, they'll put large containers next to a machine gun. So some of them say they weigh like, you know, 400 pounds or whatever, but that is one can, you know. I mean, I'm not the biggest dude ever, but. Filled with shotgun shells, I could like drag it. I wasn't really going anywhere with it by any means. You know, people are participating, so I'm just double checking here. Um, so they're talking about Nav Creek, right on, and then. Um, like some people are joining from the uh, YouTube side, maybe Clover's over. So we want to say thanks to everybody who joined us live. We try to do this nighttime show. I'm still efforting towards getting a daytime show going, getting closer towards that. Um, you guys have anything that's going on that you want to mention? No, I mean, for me, I'm just bass fishing right now, transitioning over to fly. And today was my first thoughts about deer season, trying to think of what I'm going to shoot this year and thinking about sighting it in before season gets here, try to be prepared instead of last minuting everything. 
yeah, it can make like the all the difference in the world to like be a couple of weeks ahead of all the dudes that are there at the last minute sighting in, and then like sitting there all day to take three shots to sight in. At least if you got to go to an in, like a. You know, I mean, just getting everything gathered up is half the battle. Um, I'll probably, well, I have a seven millimeter mag. I'll probably shoot, but if I can weasel into something out of the family vault, I'd like to go Creedmoor if that's available for me, but more than likely I'll shoot my seven millimeter mag. Are you shooting elk? No, just I'm here in Missouri shooting whitetail. Your white tail in Missouri must be bigger than Oklahoma if you're using a seven mag. That's what I have. <laughs> okay. Well, that makes you sense. You know, it's either 3030, 30, my seven millimeter mag, or whatever I can drag out of the family vault. I just like my shoulder better than a seven mag. Doing them from across the lake. True. No, I think I'd go with the 3030 30 out of those two also. I mean, I. I'll probably bring it along if um, I go out of town. You know, if I go up north and shoot, I'll probably bring it with me just in case I'm shooting through brush. But we'll see what happens. Well, the seven mag will go right through the brush. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. So, um, and it's the same. Those are for 120 millimeter mortars. Each can holds 22. Oh, two. Two mortars. That'd be awesome. So, uh, uh, do we know if anybody's doing anything after this? Anybody going live? I don't see anything on the main page. Sounds like Ellis is over. So, maybe we'll see something live on the main page of gun channels for people that are still awake. Otherwise, uh, uh, Knives does his live chats during the day. Tomorrow is Tuesday. So, that means uh, Ellis starts it off. With hanging with the outlaw at six, does he still do that? Then we got Ghost doing his tactical Tuesday at eight p.m. Eastern. Hit or miss at nine. Big Gunner at ten, and then we come in at midnight. Maybe I got a quote. I didn't get one tonight. I should have. I got that one from last time. Um, with that, I guess we'll end it up. And thanks everybody for watching and listening. The guys and gals of GunWebsites.com encourage you to take a CCW class every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thanks for watching GunWebsites.com.